Turkey and Greece have the same laws that apply to South Africa in Cape Town and both are completely different contexts. Do those need to be changed? Actually, even for the countries, uh, you know, bordering the vast ocean areas, even for them, they have to have maritime boundaries with neighboring countries, just like in the case of Somalia and, and Kenya. Right. They have just, you know, land boundaries, and you have to establish a maritime boundary to separate, literally, the respective maritime areas. This is even more difficult for Greece and Turkey because they have to establish both of them and there are many islands, many geographical features that complicate even further the maritime delimitation in the, in the Asian Sea and in, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea. The thing is that, you know, we have a very quite general, too general rule of delimitation in 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, but luckily we have a significant amount of jurisprudence to explain how to apply this uh, rather general rule in practice. Uh, we have a concept of equity and we also have a concept of agreement when you are doing the del maritime delimitation. That actually forces countries to negotiate before you know, considering any other you know, way of settlement I like going yeah. to court. Right. So the, the first uh, actual way that countries should uh, you know, try is go to the negotiations and try to establish an agreement of delimitation then if you fail then you may start to, you know, considering going to an international court. I want to bring that back to Somalia, given that we have the opportunity to talk to the foreign minister of Somalia. Is your relationship with Kenya strained as a result of this? Uh, thank you. No, no it's not uh, strained. Uh, because, because we talk of the potential of conf for conflict and so on because of these things. Has it, has it hurt? your job, has it hurt your relation with your neighbor? Uh, not necessarily, uh, but as the prof said, uh, you, you know, th before the ICJ accepts the case, there had to be uh, uh, an opportunity of negotiation uh, between the, the member states, and we have done that <laughs> exhaustively. That's why the, right. the court accepted it. Uh, we, the dispute uh, we had is Maritime is one of the issues. Uh, it's not the only issues. There were several other issues. So, uh, but still the relations uh, are okay now. Uh, in fact, after the court, they, they are much better. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after the court, they're much better. Mind you that uh, Kenya also contributes to the African Union peacekeeping mission right. in Somalia. Right. The, our diplomatic uh, uh, relationship is strong. Uh, we have um, one third of the population there is Somali, Kenyan. Uh, we have significant business community in, 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 in Kenya who are from Somalia but also, also Kenyans. So we are intertwined uh, and entangled uh, in a way that is uh, beyond uh, the maritime dispute. Well, that's good to hear. And let me go back then to Aoun al Khasone to ask about the, the point that we made about 20 kilometers, right? Should that, can that be just generally assigned to everybody or should there be a bit more finesse individually given particular circumstances? For example, we gave the Aegean example. Should that be looked at differently compared to other countries? my opinion there is no need to review uh, UNCLOS in any way. Some of these uh, difficulties can be clarified through jurisprudence uh, later. I don't think there is a real problem. I mean you cannot really uh, deduct a general uh, uh, conclusion from, from one case, the case of Somalia and uh, uh, and Kenya. Uh, I discern that there is a tendency now, but more in the field of arbitrations, also on uh, maritime delimitation, rather than before the court, for non-compliance, non-appearance, but it is at a very 
uh, early stage of development. One cannot, uh, you know, one cannot even say that this is the trend. This has to do. This is a very big uh, topic. Th with that's the, why we're having this okay. discussion. <laughs> with the, with the, with the uh, decline of international right. law compliance with international law, not only in maritime delimitation, that's the least controversial part of it, but in questions relating to international peace and security, to aggression, to uh, matters that touch on the charter, on state responsibility, that would require a much uh, more elaborate uh, and detailed uh, addressing of the thing. The problem that you uh, raised, uh, if I understood correctly, is since no two states in their configuration uh, with regard to the sea are the same, can we adopt general uh, principles that standardize what you would say cannot be standardized? I mean, that's yes. the way you put it. But that's true always of uh, of codification. Onclus is a work of codification and uh, the subjects of the law are never the same. I mean, you ha it addresses uh, strong and weak states. But this is the beauty, but the weakness of standardization. So if you don't mind, if you don't mind me interrupting you, I want to ask Eric how he sees the difference between the two that we brought up thus far. And I want to talk about the South China Sea, um, no, hopefully the before the end of this discussion as well. But Eric, I want to ask you, between the two that we brought up thus far, Somalia and Kenya, and the Eastern Mediterranean, right? We, as the distinguished retired judge said, no two configurations are the same, right? Two different problems, different variables, complex realities. How would you distinguish the two in terms of international maritime law and how it can go about resolving those issues between those two? Eastern Mediterranean medley of issues, but particularly focused on Greece and Turkey and Kenya and Somalia. What's the difference between the two? Well, something that is um, something that they have in common is uh, something that goes back to an old line of Napoleon's. Napoleon said that tout état fait la politique de sa géographie. Every state fashions its policy on the basis of its geography, was the idea of the great strategic mind. And so the policy, the legal policy that states formulate when they say, we believe this principle is controlling, we believe this rule is controlling and should, be, and should be interpreted in this or that way, will always, in international relations, be dictated by their general, or geographic rather, situation. So Somalia, Kenya, Greece, Turkey have all taken positions um, as to what the law to be applied is, and they will differ. Um, but they will differ within a certain bandwidth um, that international law allows. And although they may seem to be far apart, that is almost always the starting point before a negotiation begins and before a process uh, is initiated. I'll take the example of a third situation, if I may, from my part of the world, from my, my neck of the woods, Norway, Russia. Norway, Russia took 40 years to agree, and agree they did, on their maritime boundary. From 1967, there were all these meetings, very, um, uh, the petitions were very far away. Norway uh, adhered to the principle of, um, of um, equidistance. Russia took a very different view. But in spite of very strong differences, and in the end, with Mr. Lavrov, a pretty tough cookie on one, one side, Mr. Stura, today our Prime Minister, also one of the tougher kinds of cookie, they agreed. They agreed because they realized over time that they had to agree. They couldn't live with a situation where it was unclear where the maritime ent entitlements lay. And that over time is why states tend, whether directly through negotiation or through arbitration or judicial means, and then perhaps with 
parentheses of uh, non-compliance. Um, uh, That's why they tend, on the whole, to follow international law. So I don't see um, uh, our Somali-Kenyan situation or our Aegean um, Sea or Eastern Mediterranean situations or the South China Sea as insurmountable, insuperable differences. These things, you know, if you take a, the point of view of history that I'm sure my colleagues would, would agree, you know, you take a step back and you see things um, under the angle of, of history as it evolves, there is very little to worry about, I think. Right. I want to spend a few more minutes on talking about the Eastern Mediterranean before I, I go to the South China Sea. And Harry, I wonder, given the different arguments, for example, I mean, there are, there are multiple arguments. I mean, there are, Libya is also involved. There are other countries involved. But Greece says Turkey wants the hydrocarbons. Uh, Turkey says Greece is militarizing the islands and it was not supposed to based on agreements in 1914, in 1923 and so on. How crucial is it to resolve these issues as soon as possible? Because in a world of Russia invading Ukraine and all sorts of other crises, do these sometimes slip under the radar and take us by surprise? How crucial is it to resolve them? It's absolutely crucial that, that we deal with things immediately because they tend to accumulate a life of their own. If we leave them too much, then, then we have a set of old disputes upon which new issues are being, are being um, um, added all the time, making it very, very difficult, if not impossible, to deal with. So to take your example of, of the bilateral disputes between uh, Turkey and Greece, um, they had been there since uh, the, the, the 1970s. Then on top, we had um, issues accumulating, uh, be it the hydrocarbons issue, be it the Syria case, be it the, the Libya case, be it the, um, uh, the, 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 um, the Greek memorandum with Egypt, and so on and so forth. So effectively, the accumulation of all this makes for a cluster where we started with one problem and then through the addition of all these, now we have a multi-layer, multi-actor, multi-issue kind of cluster that is really difficult to deal with. And within this, it's exceedingly difficult to differentiate between the legal and political aspects making what it is. I'm glad you mentioned the, the case of the two because to my mind, important legal elements are there. But effectively, at the end of the day, at least between Turkey and Greece, we, we, we're talking about a... a, a um, a dispute pertaining to a massive lack of trust on either side. Um, the, both present very sound legal argumentation. Just, just for, the, for the short of this discussion, I think Greece sticks more with the black letter of the law where Turkey um, lies more with the jurisdiction of international organs in the ICJ. Both, to my mind, absolutely legal positions to, to start with. So effectively, Again, if there is a will, there is a way. If negotiations can go ahead between the two and reach a conclusion, fantastic. If not, then they can decide commonly to have a recourse to, international, um, a, um, to, to an international medium, uh, be it the ICJ with maximal, right. I think, um, domestic legitimacy or others. Um, as we say in Turkish, you know, if, if, if there is a will, there is a way to do it, right. and I think there are. Uh, final point, if I may, sure. just, just to recapitulate on this. Um, Let's not stick with obsolete or artificial um, obstacles to these things. Um, we've talked about the law of the sea convention. The Republic of Cyprus slash South Cyprus um, stop, be, did not stop before entering into a delimitation agreement with Israel that has not signed the law of the sea convention, and that's fantastic if both wanted to do it. Um, there is no issue of recognition because both the Republic of Cyprus slash South Cyprus and, and, and Turkey have been parties before the European Court of Human Rights. Again, they don't recognize each other and it's fine. I'm glad you brought up the Norway-Russia uh, agreement because that, that's exactly about it. And finally, if, if Lebanon is talking to Israel at the moment, and, I, and I'm not sure if I, I don't care if they're going to, to reach conclusion or not, but if they're talking, then there's very little that can convince either me or the international community, I think, that, they, that there is absolutely no way for, let's say, the two sides of Cyprus to sit on a table and at least talk to each other. Right, right. Good point. Uh, Eugen Adger, do you want to build on that? Actually, I can add a couple of points sure. on this significant matter. Actually, as I said, uh, 
previously, uh, you know, we have an international law rule, um, and luckily we have a, a significant amount of jurisprudence explaining what equity means. So it's uh, actually, if we consider the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, for example, it's up to the related sites to apply this vast amount of jurisprudence. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I agree with Henry that uh, it's all unfortunately politics sometimes. Otherwise, international law at our time is you know, clear enough to settle the maritime boundaries in any maritime area. Uh, I, I can say that 1982 Law of the Sea Convention is a successful convention, but not all in aspects. Right. It is uh, actually failing to give a concrete rule of delimitation. That's why Turkey, I think Turkey is not really very happy, out, happy about that. But um, um, fortunately, we have a jurisprudence. Uh, and, and the last point I have to add is that the delimitation disputes are not only about hydrocarbon resources. It's all primarily about the sovereign rights, right. territorial rights, that's why it would be always significant issues, even if the carbon hydrate resources right. fail to be import important for all countries. And there's a history, and borders were drawn and changed, and populations went from one way to the other, and back and forth, and so on, and these are not easy things to untangle, right? And yeah. one of the problems I have talking of untangling, untangling things is that we have 10 minutes left. I want to open up to a couple of questions from the floor as well as get at least a comment on the South China Sea because from everything that I can draw out of what we discussed, one of the analogies given earlier on was the David and Goliath thing. And I guess what came to mind, and we're not going to have an opportunity to have an expansive discussion about the South China Sea, but you can, any one of you can correct me if I'm wrong, in that situation it seems to be a bunch of Davids and one Goliath, which complicates it even more. Uh, it's the country w whose name is in the, <laughs> the definition of the sea. <laughs> so I wonder if I can get a quick comment on that dispute on maritime boundaries and what it means from each one of you before I open it to the floor for, a, I'd say, two questions because otherwise we run out of time and then we'll wrap up. So, uh, Minister, would you care to comment on the situation in the South China Sea? No? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's just getting a diplomat in trouble, you know. It's, I apologize. But, <laughs> but you did well. <laughs> Trap avoided. Aoun el Khassone. Arbitration. Maybe. Because I, I really am not following. Okay. <laughs> okay. No problem. Eric? What, what is the answer to, to that question? It's, um, if, if people are interested in reading the award in the case, it is, I think, 650 or so pages. It deals with a very uh, long range of different questions. Um, um, China, when the case came before the arbitral tribunal, so the court in the <laughs> commas, decided not to show up. Um, it took the view that we don't believe that you, the arbitral tribunal, have jurisdiction, have the competence to say anything about us. Um, and it lost. States sometimes often lose cases when they decide not to show up. Um, and I think I limit myself to saying that that is a bad idea. China, for a number of reasons, benefits and will benefit from engaging with international law as it does on a number of other fronts, where in a sense it's been... Um, um, stealing a march on, on the West in developing parts of international law. And um, I may be too much of an optimist on behalf of international law, but I think that give it 10, 20 years and the award will not be um, um, discussed in this particular way um, then. Okay. Harry? I really don't feel competent to... Um to um, comment on, on the content. What I would say is that um, the international community has done a very good work of at least trying to come up with a very long number of indicative, at least, um, ways of, of uh, dispute settlement. Only the Law of the Sea Convention enumerates indicatively more than 20. 
Um, so the best that countries can do is, is, is at least pick one of them, um, and I'm not choosing one necessarily. Um, but prioritize the peaceful settlement of international disputes because that's not only what they should do, but that is an obligation, a very clear obligation under international law. Professor? Actually, I have no reason not to comment on this because I'm not a politician, so I have to say a couple of things about South, South China Sea disputes. They are significant because they create a lot of tension uh, between the neighboring countries. But you know, politically speaking, it's quite complicated, but technically speaking or legally speaking, it's not really a complicated issue. It sounds to be like all about the historical arguments of China. That's not difficult to settle, but I think the politics are complicating too much. So we cannot blame international law uh, for not re producing solutions to these disputes, but rather politics, I think. I see. I want to give the opportunity to two questions, and I apologize if we can't get any more. Gentleman over there, go ahead. Uh, she's bringing, is she bringing a microphone? No, okay, so uh, I think so. We can hear you anyway, but I guess for the sake of everybody else, please go ahead. Uh, we can't, maybe you turn it on? Is that, it's not turned on. Okay, now it might be. No, why don't you just project? It? Go, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. I think your microphone is working. Go ahead. N now? Yeah. Yes, perfect. So, uh, thank you for all panelists and organizations. It was great to hear your, p your opinion. My name is Sina, and I'm a fourth year law student at Galatasaray University. Um, so, my, my question is um, lately I read an article about the freezing the delimitation um, um, borders, the lim the, so limits. Um, in case of the rise, rise of the sea uh, due to the climate change. So uh, in that case, uh, what do you think? So should we uh, redraw the limits according to UNCLOS or should we um, freeze the limits uh, as it is today? Uh, what are your opinion on that? I guess, I, I guess the question is who wants to tackle that? Climate change is changing things rising sea levels, changing boundaries over time slowly. Anybody want to tackle that? Harry? Well, if I may, in, in every challenge there's an opportunity. Um, and the opportunity here, I think, is that if we, if we really embrace the bigger problem, which is climate change, we're going to be left <coughs> very soon with either nobody to negotiate with or anything to negotiate about. Um, the, the thing is that, that environmental, environmental challenges now give us the impetus to move ahead. According to the UN, the, the Eastern Mediterranean and broader Middle East region is the number one area on the planet where climate change is happening the fastest. So we're going to tackle this. We have to at some point. So if we use the opportunity now of moving ahead on the basis of leaving behind certain things that to my mind are obsolete, like negotiating on hydrocarbons, because renewable energy does not have ownership. There's nothing to fight about. You only have added value from, from interconnectedness as such. The, the, the future, I think, we're, we're looking into the eye now. It's, it's going to be electrification and interconnectedness, and this, I think, should give us the impetus to move ahead with, with that looking forward rather than fighting wars of the past that, that to my mind, will be obsolete very quickly. Okay. I, I, I should sure. point on this. Uh, I can't remember which case was that, but in a single case, the court actually examined this argument of global warming and uh, you know possible effect on on some rocks or islands, and the court said that uh, it has to decide the existing situation and he, it cannot act on a possible you know, probabilities. So that's why we can say that, you know, the courts are actually deciding on the existing circumstances rather than, you know, possible right. circumstances. I think it's a, it's a fascinating question and it's a really interesting, uh, it's something to ponder because people don't think one, two, three, four, five steps ahead. I remember some uh, talk show host 
had said that oh, climate change doesn't bother him because people who live who have villas on on the ocean front will just sell up and, and move inland when when there's rising seawaters and somebody answered sell to whom <laughs> when the time comes who the hell's going to buy their houses right and people don't think these things through um so final question go ahead uh the microphone is right at your doorstep okay, thank you thank you no problem. my name is Adrian Olgun. i'm from the turkish part of northern cyprus thank you uh, harry uh, for for sort of opening a window for a question because you said uh, Republic of Cyprus slash Southern Cyprus. So that's, that's, that's a critical statement on which I want to comment. Now, um, uh, maritime disputes are sometimes not between states, but they also may relate to sovereignty issues with, within a particular state where there is the sovereignty issue is disputed, as in the case of Cyprus. And uh, in the case of Cyprus, there are two co-owners of the island, and one of the sides is claiming to be the single sovereign at the exclusion of the rights of the other side. And that brings up the issue of not only uh, sort of uh, uh, disputes between states, but also within a claimant state and the other equal party in that state. So how do we deal with an issue like that where Despite international law, one of the sides is being excluded from its own rights, uh, whilst the other side claims to be the single owner. I wonder who wants to tackle that. I mean, it, because built into the question is to solve the maritime issues related to the island, you have to solve the island, right? I mean, that's the two are, are intertwined. Anybody want to tackle that or even comment on that? The, 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 the way the international courts, forgive me. <laughs> well, we'll see. The way the international courts and tribunals tend to deal with that type of difficult question is to say that we have jurisdiction and competence to deal with a maritime delimitation question. We cannot solve the sovereignty question that is so large and a, um, a necessary um, first step in order to reach our second step. So I don't feel competent to do it. Maybe others do. Um, um, Last chance, and that will be our final answer because we're, I mean, we, we did start late and I kept it to an hour. Um, and in fairness to the next panel, we're going to have to wrap. So anybody with a final comment? Anybody? I can only say that, sure. you know, uh, in all um, uh, decisions, uh, court decisions on maritime delimitation, the courts are quite careful about possible rights of others. You know, when they are dealing with the rights of two countries and they are also quite careful about the, the possible rights of third countries. So that's why I think in, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, all countries should be quite careful about the possible rights of others including the Northern Cyprus, uh, Northern uh, Cyprus rights are I think the rights that should be taken into account when we talk about the maritime boundaries. Sure, please go ahead. Go ahead sir. I mean, uh, in addition to the traditional method of judicial settlement, there is a new, recently emerged uh, trend Thank you. Uh, to share natural, natural resources uh, by agreement of the two parties without deciding questions of sovereignty. I think in Japan this is the case and others. Uh, and this may, uh, may take care of the uh, need to go through this uh, process and uh, will, will also circumvent the question that international law sometimes uh, supplies simple recipes right. for complex problems. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my last thing. And it's an interesting point and maybe I'll just give a, a little bit of promotion to a panel coming up tomorrow, which is about the African free trade development area, which one of my questions, I know you're not going to be on the panel, Minister, but one of the questions I'm going to ask is, how, for example, Somalia and Kenya, if Africa is moving towards economic integration, why not share the resources or come to some sort of agreement when it comes to what's offshore? Um, I do apologize. We are out of time. It's been a pleasure having all of you on uh, the panel. For this discussion, Abdi Said, Musa Ali, Auna Khasone, Eric Bjorga, Harry Timitras, and Yujel Ajer, I thank you kindly. Thank you, everybody.